At the agenda this week, we discussed a convergence of health care standards both north and south of the border, the complicated history of Jews and the military, and the challenges faced by small business in a big box world. But our Week in Review begins with the successes and stumbles of Toronto Mayor Rob Ford. We had a bit of a list there of some of the things that this first term of Rob Ford um, have included. We didn't mention the business about the football team, the use of city staff with the high school football team. We didn't mention yet the alleged grabbing of former mayoralty candidate Sarah Thompson's behind at a public event. We haven't mentioned the alleged video where the mayor is supposed to be smoking crack, uh, the arrest of the mayor's occasional driver, Sandra Lee. Anyway, there's been a few other things as well on the list. And yet, and that's all this calendar year, I believe, and yet, Thousands upon thousands of people showed up at a barbecue for Ford Fest, as he does every year. Thousands upon thousands. Explain, John. Well, I think that I think he's a curiosity. Um, you know, there are always these photographs that show up of the mayor standing with some young person at some external, uh, some outside event. And my theory is that people are intrigued by him. He's this very dominant figure in our city at the moment. Uh, whether, whether the fact that people show up at, at his barbecue or want to be photographed with him is an indication of support, I don't know. I think he's, he's kind of a, he's this weird object in the middle of our life at the moment. Marcus. Yeah, I, I've got to differ with you there. I think he's more than a circus attraction. I've been to, I was both at both of those Ford Fests and his true believers, they are hardcore. They love the guy. They love, first of all, his policies, kind of low taxes and, and so on. But they also love something about him. It's because he comes across as a regular guy. He's got this authenticity. He, uh, he's a little um, loose around the edges. He's, he says what he wants. He gets in trouble for saying what he wants. He's and not they, polished, is he? He's not polished. And in an age when so many politicians are so programmed, so, you know, blow-dried, so careful not to say the wrong thing. The fact that he is a little, a bit of a loose cannon is almost an attractive thing to, to people. So I think that authenticity really sells. You two know him in a different way because your colleagues with him on city council. So let me get your take on how you explain all of these controversies, <laughs> gaffes, scandals, and yet enduring popularity. Well, I think the one thing that Rob has done is he has stayed true to his brand. And he has a brand, as you mentioned, as the cost-cutting little guy who is going to save the taxpayer. Now, the fact that he's not that person is, is relevant for people who, that, that they see that brand in Rob Ford. And, and when they elected him, they knew that he drank. He had an issue with the ACC that people knew about. There was issues around drug use that they knew about. He was arrested in Florida. That was well known. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. So when they, when they elected Rob Ford, they elected a man with foibles who was going to take care of their taxes. And he has been that same person for the last three years. But you just said it's, it, he's not entitled to that moniker of the tax fighter or the, you know, the, the guy who ends the gravy train. Well, no, I don't, he's not, a, he's not, although he presents as the common man, like the reality is he can host a barbecue for 5,000 people and pay for it himself. Right, like, so that's not common. It's not. No, I can't do that. Like you know, Paul can't, can't do, do that. Right. So he he enjoys a special people. privilege that mm -hmm. he's able to pay for his expenses, host these parties, um, have his own driver. Right. It, he, he he. Although he's he, because of his personal wealth, he's able to do all these things. He still appears very much as the common man, and because he has all these foibles, it makes him seem that much more often authentic, and he's yeah. never deviated from his brand. Mm -hmm. Now. You know, I, I said once to, to, to the Toronto Star, you know, if, if he had taken a cab, right, to 650 Dixon or wherever it is, right, and expensed it. This is the place where the so-called right, right, drug stuff was happening. It's not that he goes happening. there. If he had taken a cab and expensed it, well, then we would have heard the outcry because that would have deviated. That would have been a deviation from his brand, <laughs> right? But the fact that he went there and that he has friends and that are different than, you know, and, and gets himself into trouble that you and I might not get into, mm. That's not new. And when people voted for him three years ago, they knew that that's what they were getting. Paul, how do you explain it? Well, I, going back to the last election, and I agree with Marcus and, and Karen, you know, the, my wife worked downtown at the time, and a lot of her the people she worked with were voting for George Smitherman. Mm -hmm. And then out in my ward, people say, well, I'm voting for Rob Ford because he's going to stop the gravy. Or, you know, 
he's going to hire more police officers. And I used to laugh. I'd say, well, you know, I worked on the budget committee for four years. I worked for a city councilor that was the chair of the budget committee. And if I thought we could get rid of all the waste in city hall and solved our budget problems, I would have. But, you know, people always believe there's waste in government. And, you know, I, you look at crime, where crime was going down across the board in every category, but you still see the front page of a shooting or a stabbing. And they believe that we need more police because it must be because there's a murder on the front page of the paper. And Rob Ford just took that and put it all together. And his core supporters still believe that. I've seen a lot of people yeah. around the fringe yeah. are dropping off because they've seen his other issues that are now coming with that. But, but you could dig yeah. down to the core support. It's still stop the gravy and we need more cops. We'll put a graphic up here and show how the whisper jet, as it's called, compares to the turboprop plane. People are very skeptical that this CS100 is going to be as quiet as what you've got running right now. Should they be skeptical? I think they might have been, had some reason to be skeptical despite the assurances of uh, Bombardier's and the performance guarantees that we have in our, uh, in our contract up until the time that the aircraft flew, uh, which was uh, you know, just uh, now about a month ago. And, uh, but I think most of those uh, concerns were put uh, to rest when the, uh, when the uh, CS-100 uh, whisper jet flew for the first time on uh, September the 16th. And it, I, I happened to be there and it was incredible. I mean, the aircraft uh, was described by many as being silent. And it was the next best thing to being silent that you've ever heard of a, a jet aircraft. Uh, it departed in front of about 3,000 people who were there, including some Bombardier uh, uh, employees and, uh, and some invited guests and media. And it was almost by the grandstand and on its way uh, off uh, for its two and a half hour uh, test flight before some people even noticed that it was airborne. So it was that quiet. And it was, com it was preceded in the flight by a, uh, a global uh, 5,000 aircraft, which is pretty quiet and environmentally friendly, but not as quiet as that CS-100. I think that this aircraft could well come in, certainly co at, at comparable levels to the Q-400 that we operate, but maybe even quieter. Well, the other argument besides the noise is that if you get your way, there will be a heck of a lot more traffic flying in and out of Billy Bishop. And I guess people who live down by the waterfront don't want that many that large number of planes flying in and out. Is that an issue? Well, it's a little bit of a misconception because you have to think about the, uh, the CS-100, uh, the Whisper Jet, in terms of what its mission would be. What, what purpose would we use it for? And when you're flying it out to Vancouver or to Los Angeles or down into Florida or the Caribbean, you kind of realize that you know, it might well go out in the morning um, three and a half to five hours and then maybe a, an hour changeover on the ground at the other end and then back uh, to original destination. So it could be gone eight to ten hours. So on a typical uh, uh, return flight. And that's quite different than the Q400 turboprops that we operate today. Now the turboprops are quiet but they do come and go on a regular basis from uh, Billy Bishop Airport. So we might get eight flights in in a day in a, with a turboprop, whereas we may only get one flight in with these whisper jets. And so the amount of contact they actually have with uh, the Billy Bishop Airport would be pretty minimal. Okay, you need City Hall's approval to do this, right? Absolutely. How's that yeah. going? Well, you know, we don't take anything for granted there. I mean, uh, it's one of those situations where you have to go uh, to every single councillor plus the mayor and you have to convince them of the merits of the plan. We are hopeful that by the time uh, City Council votes on this uh, on the 16th of December, that they'll be convinced of the benefits that it will bring to the city and to the traveling public. So, and there'll be a thousand new jobs added as a result of uh, what we're doing as well, which will add to the already pretty extensive $2 billion annual uh, economic benefit that accrues to the city of Toronto. Obamacare may have moved America's health care system closer to what we have in Canada, but both systems still feature financial burdens placed on the patient, as well as other common problems and inefficiencies that are transforming both our health care systems. So, joining us now to tell us more about these changes, Trudy Lieberman. She is contributing editor for the Columbia Journalism Review and past president of the Association of Healthcare Journalists in the United States, 
And Andre Picard is here. He's public health reporter and columnist with the Globe and Mail. And Andre, it's good to see you again. Trudy, nice to have you on the program for the first time. Thank you. I know everybody's been following all of the drama south of the border, and it's all a big fight which has its genesis in Obamacare. But I still think there's a lot of people who don't really know what Obamacare is. So will you help us out, Trudy, and just give us your handy-dandy definition for what it is? It's um, basically a way to expand health insurance to more Americans who have not had insurance um, to cover health problems. So we had about 51 million people who were uninsured at the time the Affordable Care Act passed. And after the act is fully implemented, we're still going to have around 30 million people who will still be uninsured. So at its core, it extends coverage to a certain number of people in the U.S. population. So even after all is said and done, there will still be millions of Americans not covered by health insurance, even with Obamacare. That's correct. How come? Well, because we don't have a, a truly universal system. We do not have social insurance. It's not a social insurance program. We have basically just tinkered with the private model that we have and improved uh, one of our insurance markets to make it more easy for people to join it and to buy into it. In other words, that market has become more palatable to certain people who had been excluded from buying in that market because they had pre-existing conditions or they couldn't afford it. Well, you know, essentially in Canada we have, if you want to use the American analogy, we have a silver plan. So about 70% of our care is covered publicly, and 30% we have to pay either uh, with private insurance or out-of-pocket. Canadians are the largest out-of-pocket spenders of insurance in the world outside the U.S. So we spend a lot of money outside of our Medicare system. So there's universal health care, but it has a little asterisk at it. Well, it's a big asterisk, actually. It's, it's 60, getting bigger. $62 billion worth of private spending in our single-payer universally covered uh, socialized medicine system, if I can put it that way. Exactly. That's a big asterisk. It is. And essentially what we have, we have, uh, to use the technical term, a bifurcated system. We're the only, we're also unique. We're the only country in the world that has this. We cover 100% of hospital and physician care. And we cover various amounts of other things, about zero for dental care, uh, right through to about 50% for uh, drugs. So all across the board, there's these other things that are really important to your, your health and your medical care, but they're not part of the universal plan. Some Canadian doctors have money-making opportunities on the side, and who's to stand in their way, right? But there is a shortage of family doctors. What happens then if those money-making ventures take them out of their publicly funded offices too much? And are there rules in place to govern these doctors and potential financial conflicts of interest that may arise? Joining us now to help answer these questions and others in Sydney, Nova Scotia, via Skype, Dr. Monica Dutt. She is chair of Canadian Doctors for Medicare, public health specialist and a family physician with the Cape Breton District Health Authority. And with us here in studio, Dr. Karen Dockrell. She is a pediatrician and perinatal specialist based in Whitby, Ontario. And of course, we welcome back André Picard, the columnist with the Globe and Mail. Okay, Dr. Dockrell, should we start with you here? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You, obviously, you're a doctor, but you had a business on the side that was a part of your practice. What was that called? That was the Mom and Baby Depot. And how long did you have that operating for? Uh, it ran from 2006 and really officially closed totally in 2012. And what kind of services were you offering? Well, Mom and Baby Depot was it's what we called a concept clinic. It was put together by families who told us what are the services they used and valued in the early years of parenting or growing kids till school age. We brought all those services into like a one-stop shopping experience. And with it, gave them access through a membership fee to breastfeeding consultants, to nurse educators, to parenting support programs, uh, some dental assessment, preventative health services, dietitians, many others. But really what was the gold feature of the program was a, the, um, what we called a well family care visit which was two hours based on the Bright Futures program out of the United States, what met with a family at the intervals of critical development of their baby and their child and offered them good anticipatory guidance, uh, problem solved with them about any challenges they were having as a family, well, not just a, with the health, but with the mom, the dad, and even extended family. All about keeping people were. healthier. Absolutely. That's the idea. You want a, a little health prevention, keep them out of the hospitals, treat their sicknesses when they have to, that type of thing? Absolutely, and gave them the tools to prevent some of those emergency mm -hmm. visits and other things. Well, I think it's 
fairly straightforward when we're talking about private for-profit care that people shouldn't have to pay for medically necessary services. And I think that's a, you can debate what, what's medically necessary or not, but in our system, you don't need to pay for things like immunizations and well baby checks. So I think it's fairly simple that people don't need to pay for that care. It's a little different when you're talking about for-profit aspects of it. So doctors are able to charge for other services that they may be offering. But I think in this situation and in others, you do get into difficulties when they're being offered under the same roof because you get into situations where there's the potential for profit to be the motivator as opposed to the care of the patient. And there's lots of examples of that, of people getting more testing than they needed, more treatment than they needed because there is a profit motive either for the, the physician or perhaps for the, the investors in a company. And then the other aspect is, is the, the perception of the patient. So even if it's perfectly clear to the patient that they don't need to pay a fee to access certain care, they may think that they should pay that fee in order to get good care, even for things that are normally covered. Or they may feel like if they don't agree to the other services that they're being offered, they may not get good care overall. We have a lot of doctors who work strictly on the government plan in the province they're on. They get all their income from that. That's easy, cut and dried. We have a small, very small percentage of doctors who opt out entirely. All their business is private. That's simple too. It's the little, what, what do we do with people who straddle both? That's, that's the really difficult one. Uh, it, you know, cases like this are not cut and dried, but what's wrong about this case is that the unfairness of it all. So unfairness are, to whom? Uh, well, to Dr. Dockrell, for example, and to the public, because they're, they're not sure what the rules are. Because there's all kinds of clinics like this that exist uh, with fees, with membership groups for adults, and they're perfectly fine. They don't get pursued by the college. Uh, people are willing to pay it. Should that influence our legislation? These are, these are really difficult areas. So what we're doing, is, as Dr. Dutt said, is we want to ensure that people get medically necessary care, that they pay for it, they don't feel pressured that they have to pay extra to get the care. How do you do that? How do you allow that and still have people straddle the line? So there's all kinds of gray areas and, and they're getting grayer, if you will. Your book, you know, is getting some great notices. It's being hailed as one of the two or three best books ever about Israel. And you tell the story that you tell by looking through the eyes of seven paratroopers. And let's start with this. How did you choose those seven? It took about two years into the project before I realized who the main protagonists were. The book took 11 years to write. And, and one of the main challenges was sorting through 2,000 men who had fought in the battle for Jerusalem. And eventually, I, I decided to focus on two groups. One group of uh, former paratroopers who became leaders of the West Bank Settlement Movement on the right, and the other group became leaders of the Israeli Peace Movement on the left. And telling the story of, of Israel's internal schism between left and right through seven men who fought wars together, not only 1967, they went on to fight the Yom Kippur War in 1973, and we're now 40 years observing the 40th right, right now. Right to the month. Literally, that's yeah. right. And, and these were the guys who actually won the Yom Kippur War. They crossed the Suez Canal in the middle of the war <laughs> and, uh, and, and turned the battle uh, against, against the Egyptian army. And so to take seven men who participated in these mythic conflicts and, and then to try to understand Israel's domestic issues, Israel's internal conflicts over identity, over borders, through these guys who, who, who won these wars, I felt was, was a, for me at least, it was, a, 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 it was, a, it was interesting enough to keep, to keep me going for 11 years. I think you described them as spiritual elites. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, you have, they come out of really two, two camps, the left and the right. The right comes <laughs> out of a, a movement known as religious Zionism. And this was a movement that saw what, for most Zionists, was a secular movement. They saw Zionism in religious terms. And some of them were actually messianists. They believed that in the, in the Jewish return to Zion, the, the messianic process literally would be triggered. And that became the basis, or part of the basis, for the West Bank Settlement Movement. The other movement, the peace movement, came out of what we used to call in Israel, really, the, 
the kibbutz movement. Mm -hmm. And the kibbutz was an agrarian socialist commune. Uh, and the, the kibbutz movement helped establish the state of Israel. It was once the avant-garde of, uh, of, of, of Israeli society. And uh, an extraordinary phenomenon. It has now been largely privatized, mm -hmm. uh, as so much else has. And uh, the kibbutz is, seems to have gone the way of the 20th century. But in, in Israeli society, in these critical decades that I'm writing about, the kibbutz movement still had that vitality and really carried so much of the Israeli story. And so the book becomes, uh, a, a, it becomes the story of, of the settlement movement on the one hand coming out of the messianic religious right, mm -hmm. and the kibbutz movement, the peace movement, coming out of the socialist uh, secular left. Just to follow up on the kibbutzniks, because I think they were only about 4% of the population, exactly but they right. punched well above their weight. Why oh, did they yeah. have such clout in the country? Well, they, they were raised on, on an ethos of service, of national service. Mm -hmm. And so the paratroopers who were in, in these years of the, the first decades of the state were, were the, the elite fighting unit of Israel. 50 plus percent of the men were from these agrarian communes. Uh, upwards of 70 percent were off, of the officers' corps were kibbutzniks. And this ethos of, of service, which began in childhood when they were, when they were raised to, to see themselves as the elite of, of the Jewish return home and as the, the incubator of, of, of democratic socialism. Uh, they, they, they imbibed this ethos of service and then became uh, really leading figures in the military and then in the peace movement. One of your religious paratroopers is um, out of a religious center in Jerusalem run by a rabbi named Tzvi Yehuda Koch. How would you describe his significance? He was a very a, a fascinating and complicated character. He was someone who, on the one hand, was um, deeply pious, almost, almost ultra-Orthodox in his appearance. So black garb and... Black garb, black hat, long beard. white beard. Mm -hmm. And yet, on the other hand, had a deep love for, for every Jew. He was... He was, he was working out of a particular theology that made place for every Jew, no matter how secular. And he loved the kibbutzniks. Hmm. And he taught his students to, to, to reach out to them on a, on a principle of indiscriminate love. And so that was, that was one side of Rabbi Tzvi. That would Rabbi not be the case today, would it? Much less so, yeah. much less so. And the other, the other side, and this is really how he's remembered more of it, I'm glad that you that you raise him because I think that he's a much more nuanced character than the way Israeli society remembers him today. Israeli society recalls the Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Cook, who was militantly, really, really fiercely uh, advocating West Bank settlement and the annexation of the territories. So he injected himself into Israel's most bitter internal debate between left and right, but there was this <coughs> other side of him, a much softer, more embracing side. And that's Part of the story I'm trying to tell in this book is a nuanced tale of Israel that goes deeper than what we think of as left and right. And the protagonists in this book, many of them, don't stay in the same place. Mm. They start out right wing, they end up center left. They start out left wing, they end up skeptical of the peace process. And it's that dynamism uh, of Israeli society that tends to get lost when Israel is translated abroad. Well, the author has made a similar kind of journey, has he not? He has. <laughs> <laughs> Politically, ideologically speaking? Yeah, I mm -hmm. would say that I've covered at this point in my life most of the points <laughs> along the political spectrum. Uh, I grew up uh, as a teenager in Brooklyn, New York, uh, the son of a, uh, of a very angry Holocaust survivor. Uh, and the way in which I processed the, the Holocaust, and we're talking about the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, was to join the most militant uh, right-wing Jewish group, the Jewish Defense League of Rabbi Meir Kahana. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, saw, I saw that as, as, as my way of coping with this overwhelming legacy. And over the years, I began to distance myself from militant politics. 
But because of that experience, I'd say I have a soft spot or at least an understanding for, for radicals in whatever flavor. <laughs> and, and that actually helped me write this book because uh, I'm dealing with left-wing radicals, right-wing radicals. And there you are happily in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where <laughs> I place myself now is very much in the middle. Uh, I, I'm, I identify strongly with the center of the Israeli map. But emotionally and in terms of personality, I, I resonate with the radical persona. I don't think Mark Zuckerberg was ever a small business owner. I think there's a big difference between a startup and a small business. I think there's a big difference between self-employed and an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is an agent of change, someone who is looking to drive innovation, to take resources from a suboptimal to a more optimal place, moving mail from a 14-day turnaround from Hong Kong to New York to 14 seconds. That's entrepreneurship. That isn't what 99% of our businesses are. 99% of our businesses are small businesses. Uh, a startup is not a small business. A startup is not a smaller version of a big business. So we conflate those ideas all the time. All the time. A yeah. startup is a temporary organization that is searching for a scalable, sustainable business model. A small version of a big business is a small business. They're not the same thing as startups. That doesn't mean they're not valuable, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking after mm -hmm. them, but we have to have the terms right if we're going to really try to address them appropriately. Mitch, given that he's being contentious right off the top, do you want to be contentious and come back at him on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I would just throw back that I know many small business owners who are extremely entrepreneurial. We have a, you know, we're here with 100 plus people. We're extremely entrepreneurial. We are entrepreneurs. We are running the business. We are definitely trying to scale. But I have many contemporaries who have remained 30, 40 people as an agency very similar to ours that they are still entrepreneurs. They are the entrepreneurs running the business, trying to continue it, trying to sustain it within a certain scale that would fall within that definition of small business. Dan's turn to be contentious. Yeah, well, look, somebody can be entrepreneurial in, in, very, in many walks of life. You can be entrepreneurial in government, for, for example, while that seems like an oxymoron. Yeah, no you see much of that? Uh, not as much as we'd like, but, but I will say one of the qualities about that, that is true of entrepreneurs and small business people is that element of risk taking. And, and that is a huge commonality that exists, I think, right across the spectrum, that you're not, uh, you're not out there with a guaranteed paycheck. Uh, you're somebody there that is as good as your last sale. Uh, and you may not be in business if you don't continue to, uh, to, to operate. But the, the piece that I worry about an awful lot is not just those businesses that choose to stay small, small for their own reasons, but those that have perhaps tried to grow and then are knocked back and be, they, they essentially give up uh, because they have seen so many roadblocks put in their way by, by banks, by uh, governments, uh, by all sorts of agencies. And that's the part that, of course, uh, for our 109,000 members at CFIB is the part we spend a lot of time. That's what I just on. wanted you to remind us of. Over 100,000 members and what percentage would be small or medium enterprises? Yeah, so they'd be all, all, all small and medium-sized firms. We, do have a, we don't kick somebody out if you're big, but you have to be independently owned and operated to be a member of CFIB. Gotcha. And how many of those members do you think would self-identify as entrepreneurs? I think they all would. I mean, I think, I think that is another defining characteristic, is that small business owners really do see themselves as entrepreneurs, uh, but their motivations and how they got there is, is often wildly different. Some of them, of course, have gone because they've had a limited opportunity and paid employment. Some have been there because they've taken over a family business. So. Uh, it is, uh, but I, I think that they would, in their heart of hearts, feel that they are entrepreneurs, absolutely. Rick, do you ask the question because you're not sure they all ought to identify that way? Well, I've been covering the small business scene for many years. I was editor of Profit. We called it the magazine for Canadian entrepreneurs. And we sort of defined entrepreneurs as anyone who wants to really grow their business, uh, develop innovation, and really do something special with it. As compared to the sort of lifestyle business owners, which are you know, just enough to keep, keep, keep uh, the family fed and, and shoes on the feet and food on the table. But in recent years, though, I've gotten much looser about using the word entrepreneur to describe small business because the new generation of people that I see coming into small business, whether they're involved in the tech industry, which I think has heavily influenced Sean's thinking, or not, they're very much entrepreneurial. They're very much thinking about how do I make this something special not necessarily in terms of growing it, but in terms of making it a business that expresses my identity, my values, my purpose on earth, make it different from other things, and how do I collaborate with other like-minded business mm. owners? And business owners is a clunky word. Entrepreneurs somehow just manage to catch that feeling very well. Gotcha. Mitch, if I were to ask you what the prime challenges of being 
a small or medium-sized enterprise owner today versus, say, 25 years ago. What's really different today about trying to make a go of it in this world? Well, I think what, what the challenges are are also the opportunities. I mean, the ability for a small, uh, an independent owner to open up a store now, you would sort of look geographically in the past and think like, I can open it on this street with this amount of foot traffic, can now actually open that store up to the world and they could be running it from their basement. So there are, there are dynamics at play that I think are both the challenges and the opportunity at the same time. So the challenge is how do you, how do you be small and act global because you can and it's very cost effective to do so. Um, the opportunities are uh, geographically, how do you take advantage of things like tax, tax credits and R&D and research and development and just sort of real estate that's now being offered to people who are starting up things locally. Um, so it's it's funny to sort of think about it in, in that paradox. Uh, you know, again, I, I definitely understand what we're talking about with the difference between startups and entrepreneurs. But in my brain, I'm sitting here going, well, you know, in, Instagram was bought for a billion dollars by Facebook. They were eight people. Uh, hmm with very little revenue, that we would have really considered a small business. Yeah, I um, wouldn't so, consider that a small business at all. I would have what, considered that a startup. What I think right. is interesting no, is what Mitch has said though. Entrepreneurs see challenges as opportunities. And as much right. as I like to give Mitch the credit for that, it was Machiavelli who said that. <laughs> and, and I think that that's true among small business owners who have to make better decisions to make more with less resources, less access maybe. But I don't think Instagram is a small business. I don't think that just because there's eight people around a table, it defines it as a small business. But it's got eight employees, so it's but not a big business. The number of head, head count isn't how you should be judging the size of a business. Revenue? Revenue would be one aspect, but then you've got two businesses so they that are... They didn't have any revenue. <laughs> I think you have to look at more of the formal terms. Uh, Roger Martin from one of the other business schools says that an entrepreneur is someone who looks at an opportunity, creates a 10x solution, and does throw with... Uh, out of the box thinking. Mitch has demonstrated all of those things. Is he an entrepreneur? Well, if it's a self identified term, as my colleague Rick has said, maybe he is. My concern is more not getting it right, it's all agreeing to it. Because I worry that when you have these looser definitions, then when you apply policy or government programs or support, you run the risk of mitigating people's expectations in the wrong way. Understood. If you're yeah, really I, looking to fund startups with shred credits, that's great. But don't make small business people who own two or three dry cleaners think that, that, uh, that, that, that they should be applying. Okay. Unless, of course, they can do, as Mitch has suggested, yeah, become innovative. What's Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a crypto digital currency. And when we say crypto, meaning secret, but uh, digital meaning it doesn't have a, a stored value like a Tim Hortons card or those kinds of things. So I can't hold it in my hand? No, you can't. Um, it's, it's, let, let me give you an analogy. It's sort of like PayPal, PayPal in the sense that you can use it for buying things, but it doesn't come from a branded consumer products company, and you don't have to identify with a credit card when you're using it. It's uh, sort of like uncut diamonds, which are used for anonymity, but it's not physically tangible like that. and doesn't have the same association, but it's also used by criminal organizations because of the anonymity. That's the Agenda's Week in Review, and you can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website. Go to theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel, and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.